Okay, it's working. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the worship uh, songs. They were uh, perfect. They kind of align with the message this morning, and I know that it wasn't planned, and I always just love it when the Holy Spirit just does that, right? Uh, pray with me, if you will. Father in heaven, we just uh, come again. We have been blessed by the music, uh, by the spirit of worship that we have come here this morning, and we have felt your presence. And Father, we just ask that you continue to be with us, that you would reveal yourself to us this morning in a special way. If we ask it in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior. And everyone said, Amen. So this morning, um, as the title says, Acceptance and a New Start. And I really struggled with what the title was going to be, um, the tale of three rich individuals. And so um, I'm going to share with you um, the story of three, ri three rich individuals, and we're going to ask uh, three quest or four questions. We're going to ask four questions of each one. Um, and the question is, what is their motivation in coming with, to Jesus? Um, what does Jesus see for them? What is their response? And what is the result of the interaction? So in, these three, in all these three different cases that we're going to look at, we want to ask these questions. So you want to be paying attention and listening in as we, as we go through uh, this. And um, for the first one, um, I used uh, Desire of Ages. And I don't know if many of you are familiar with that book, but it's a, it's a great book that just kind of follows the Gospels. Um, and um, there's a lot of insight there that you don't get sometimes in, in the, uh, you kind of fill in the blanks. And so I'm going to be using uh, uh, Desire of Ages uh, to help along to do that. But I want to start with asking a question. How many of you like paying taxes by the show of hands? That's what I thought. Okay, one. Are you an accountant? <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, nobody likes paying taxes. Now, we, we live here in the United States. Uh, we love our country. It's kind of our duty. We, we pay our taxes uh, because they go to support, you know, uh, our infrastructure, different things, whether we agree with the policies or not, we, we pay our taxes. But what if you pay taxes to somebody who uh, was an opposing power or somebody who you didn't really like? How would you feel about that? And so I think before we get into the story of Scripture, we're going to be looking and we're going to go into uh, uh, the book of Matthew. We want to set the tone for um, the context. It's, I think it's important to understand the context the time and the place and the culture, what was taking place. So uh, in the first century, uh, during Jesus', Jesus ministry, um, tax, tax collectors um, there, especially among the Jews, were perhaps the most despised of all. They were hated. They were not liked. Tax collectors were at the bottom of the rung. Uh, if you had kind of a, you know, and, and Jewish culture was also very stratified. Um, and so tax collectors were just at the very bottom. Nobody liked tax collectors. Everybody could agree that they were hated. Everyone hated tax collectors. The Roman Empire, uh, the way that they did it is that they went in and they solicited who the tax collectors were going to be, and they usually belonged to that, you know, whoever they were occupying, that's who they, they selected people that looked like them, talked like them, uh, because they felt that they would be, have more success by, you know, engaging in and um, bringing in those uh, uh, tax collectors. Uh, from the Jewish people. But if you were a Jewish person and you looked at the tax collectors, you saw them as traitors, traitors to your culture, traitors to your nation. They were hated, especially the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the time. They especially hated tax collectors, so much so that they did not have anything to do with them. They would not have anything to do with them. So it's important to understand the context that tax collectors were just hated. They were despised. They were tutorious because they were, had given up on their people. Um, and so if you were a tax collector, you lived a pretty lonely and isolated life. Nobody wanted to associate with you unless there were other tax collectors. You know, those were your friends or others, as we will see in, in the gospel. So there was this kind of visceral reaction to uh, tax collectors. There was a contempt, and it was something that everybody could agree, no matter what part of society you were from. If you were, um, you know, the priest or you were a lowly person, everybody hated tax collectors because you had to pay your taxes, right? So that's kind of the context that we're going in. So the first individual we're going to look at is Levi Matthew, the tax collector. So Levi Matthew 
is the first one that we're going to look at. And in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, um, it says, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Now, as we read that story, you know, we just kind of look at it. But this story, when we read this, we should be shocked right now. In first century, for Jesus to go there and to ask Matthew and to say to Matthew, follow me, we should be floored. We should be saying, what did he do? This, is, this, is, this does not happen because there were expectations. We have expectations. Matthew had expectations, and the expectations was that a religious leader, a, 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 a teacher of the law, a rabbi, would not have anything to do in that culture with a tax collector. And yet here we have Jesus not only walking by, going to, but asking Matthew to follow him. This was, you know, something that kind of blew everyone's mind away. Nobody expected this because really rabbis and religious leaders don't hang around with tax collectors. That just, that just does not happen. In the Desire of Ages, and I apologize, you, it's kind of dark, you can't really see it there, um, but I, this is a quote, and it says, The Pharisees had judged Matthew according to his employment, but Jesus saw in this man a heart open for the reception of truth. Matthew had listened to the Savior's teaching as the convicting spirit of God revealed his sinfulness. He longed to seek help from Christ, but he was accustomed to the exclusiveness of the rabbis and had no thought of that the great teacher would even notice him. So here Matthew, you know, just didn't even, it wouldn't even occur to him that Jesus would even talk to him. That's how much the differences were between those religious leaders and a tax collector. But I love the line that it says, but Jesus saw. So what did he see? And I highlighted it there. It says, a heart that was open, an open heart. And I think that word should be um, something that just make note of it because we'll come back to that again. A heart is like a vessel that holds things. And sometimes uh, things are cracked or sometimes things are broken. And sometimes they're empty because they are broken and open. But there's room to receive things in if, if they're open. If they're broken, there, there is room in there. Sometimes vessels, like I said, they're empty because they're broken uh, and there's room in the heart to receive the truth. But by contrast, sometimes uh, the heart can be closed. Um, and when it's closed, it is full. It's self-satisfied. There is no room for anything else to come in there. And I think this is one of the contrasts that we're going to see with the Pharisees and with the tax collector, like Matthew. So Matthew belonged to this group. Um, but Jesus says to him, follow me. Jesus' invitation to Matthew um, is amazing. Um, and it says um, here that Matthew, uh, in, in Desire Bages, page 273, says, Matthew left all. He rose up and followed him. There was no hesitation, no questioning, no thought of the lucrative business to be exchanged for poverty and hardship. It was enough for him that he was to be with Jesus and that he might listen to his words and unite with him in his work. This is his motivation. This is the reason why Matthew could go there. Matthew had been, you know, and I imagine in my mind's eye, Matthew was kind of uh, uh, there attending some of, maybe some of Jesus' sermons. Uh, and as he was talking, maybe standing off to the side because, of course, nobody wanted to associate with him. Because back in those days, there was this idea of social contamination. Uh, that means if I associate with you, I could be contaminated. I could be... Um, you know, unclean, ceremonial unclean because I've associated with you as a tax collector. But Jesus never paid any attention to that. There's no uh, hint of, in anything that Jesus, Jesus interacted with uh, rich people. He interacted with poor people. Whoever would have him, Jesus would be there. He did not discriminate. Jesus was open to who he would reach out because he wanted the gospel to go out to everyone. But the religious leaders of the time, they had a different idea. They had a different way of dealing and interacting with people. 
So it is interesting to note here that the invitation that Jesus says when he said to him, follow me, for Matthew, this was, this was kind of a, an invitation to something new, to something very different than he had experienced. This invitation is of follow me is an invitation of acceptance and a new start. That's what Matthew got out of that invitation, of that transaction. Matthew got acceptance and a fresh start. And after all, isn't that what we all long for, is acceptance and a new start? I know in my Christian experience, in coming to Jesus, that was something that having acceptance and a new start, a new beginning, was something that really motivated. Maybe that resonates with some of you in terms of your own personal experience uh, with Jesus. The calling of Matthew to be one of Christ's disciples um, excited great indignation. So follow me. It's an invitation to acceptance and a fresh start. So here, the calling of Matthew to be one of Christ's disciples excited great indignation for a religious teacher to choose a publican as one of his immediate attendants was an offense against the religious, social, and national customs. And by appealing to the prejudices of the people, the Pharisees hoped to turn the current popular feeling against Jesus. So they used this against Jesus because they knew, like, hey, he's got a tax collector. What a blunder, what a mistake did Jesus make by, you know, having him be... Uh, and it says here, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, Matt, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. So Matthew is excited because... Jesus is now, he's with Jesus, he has a new life, a new opportunity, and so he throws a party. And who does he invite? He invites tax collectors and others. Um, in Luke, uh, his version, he says, And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house, and there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. You can just feel the excitement for Matthew um, at the invitation. And he wanted to share that, just like you know, a new convert, he's on fire, he wanted to share that with Jesus. He was excited, he wanted to share, he has a party, he invites all his friends, which are mostly tax collectors uh, or others, uh, as, the mess, as uh, the, uh, 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 Luke mentioned, just others, or sinners as well. From the Desires of the Ages again, he says, among the publicans, a widespread interest was created. Their hearts were drawn toward the divine teacher. In the joy of this new discipleship, Matthew longed to bring his former associates to Jesus. Accordingly, he made a feast of his own house and called together the relatives and friends. Not only were publicans included, but many others who were of doubtful reputation were included in that invitation. Have you ever been to a party that included those of doubtful reputation? <laughs> would we feel comfortable going to a party with those that are of doubtful reputation or others or considered sinners? But here is a picture of Jesus going to this party. And I can just imagine in my mind that, you know, they're sitting there and all the tax collectors are there and they can't believe it. They're like, we have a religious leader because Think about it, they don't get any religious training or, you know, they don't, they, they don't get to go to church. They're, they're, kind of, they're kind of outside of that sphere of circle. So for them to be here with a rabbi and to be able to be listening to him and talking to him, and he's, he's kind of a delightful person and we're sitting there with Jesus and Jesus is like, hey, pass the baba ganoush and here's the hummus. Have you tried this pita? Oh, the pomegranate, you know, jam is so delicious, right? He, he's, can you see Jesus there enjoying himself, being with them, telling stories? And, and they're like, they're, they're like blown away. Like, Jesus is kind of a cool person. He's, you know, he's so relatable and he's here with us and he's, you know, and, and, and you can just feel the excitement. And it said were there that their spirits were renewed, that they were like somehow really excited to be here with Jesus. And it says here, continuing on in the story, but when Jesus heard this, oh, let me go back. So when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? This was the, the, the real, you know, problem that the religious leaders had with Jesus 
was this, that he associated with sinners, that he ate with them, that he hung out with them, that he was comfortable with them. And their question is a, is a sincere question. There's like, in Mark's version, he says, how is it? How is it that, you're, that you hang out with them? How is it that they do this? They were seriously, didn't understand how he could relate to them because there was such a gap between what they're used to, what they were accustomed in dealing with uh, tax collectors or others or those of doubtful reputation. You know, we don't want to associate with them. So they come, the Pharisees come, and they come to uh, his disciples. Notice that they don't come to Jesus. They come to his disciples. But um, when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus here has the fortitude and the audacity to tell the religious leaders, go study your own religious book. Go, go, go read and tell me what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Of course, Jesus here is quoting from Hosea, and he's quoting the first part of Hosea. Hosea, the first part, says, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice. But the second part is interesting. It says, and the, knowl and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. In other words, I mean, I know that you like to go to church and you go through all your ceremonies and like to come and, and do all those things. And yeah, I like that, but I want mercy more. And I want you to know me, that you have the knowledge of me, that you come and, and know me. That's more important to me. The religious leaders of the time, and maybe sometimes even us, maybe can we get lost in that you know, just kind of the, the routine of doing certain things and losing the fact that maybe God is really seeking more. He wants us to have mercy, to be like him and merciful or to have the knowledge of him from the desire of, of ages. Jesus sat as an honored guest at the table of the publicans and by his sympathy and social kindness showing that he recognizes, and I love this, the dignity, the dignity of humanity. And men longed to become worthy of his confidence. Upon their thirsty hearts, his words fell with a blessed life-giving power. New impulses were awakened, and the possibility of a new life opened to those outcasts of society. So you picture that. Jesus sitting there with all those, uh, you know, uh, undesirables sitting there at the table, eating, relaxing, reclining at the table, sharing stories, eating, sharing the food. And let's just pause to think about just the theological implications of this. Here is God sitting down and eating with sinners. I mean, that, that's, that's what we have, right? We have God here sitting down, eating with sinners and hanging out with them and sharing things with them and giving them hope and this hope was rekindled in their hearts. Now notice the contrast here. Um, EGW says, the Pharisees thought themselves too wise to need instruction, too righteous to need salvation, too highly honored to need the honor that comes from Christ. The Savior turned away from them to find others who would receive the message of heaven in the untutored fishermen and the publicans at the marketplace, in the woman of Samaria, in the common people who heard him gladly. Those are the ones that uh, listened to him. The Pharisees were like, we're full. Thank you very much. We're full. Um, but Jesus did not hesitate to accept the invitation, and he demonstrated through his ministry that he did not discriminate, but he reached out to all equally. How beautiful it is that Jesus sat there and he offered uh, Matthew a new start. He offered him, when he says, follow me, when he said to him, follow me, those words should ring in our minds that we say, follow me, it means acceptance and a new start. The religious leaders were too full. But the tax collectors, those of doubtful reputation, sinners who were open because they had maybe cracks in their life, 
Um, maybe they were broken inside. There were things that had happened to them. They were open to receive Jesus. But those that were full, the Pharisees, were, were too full, were, you know, uh, were too wise, too righteous. We know it all. We know everything we need to know. So, what is Matthew's motivation for coming to Christ? What was the motivation? The motivation was he just wanted to be with Jesus. He had listened to his words, and he wanted to join him in his, in his labor. What did Jesus see when he saw Matthew? Jesus sees an open heart. He was open. And so having an open heart is important. And what was Matthew's response? Matthew, he just gets up. He doesn't, he doesn't hesitate. He follows Jesus. And what was the result of their interaction? Well, Matthew becomes one of Jesus' disciples, right? He wrote, you know, the book that, has, that bears his name. That was the result of Levi Matthew. The next person we want to look at is the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler is another um, wealthy individual that had an interaction with Jesus. So Matthew was rich because he was a tax collector. Um, he, you know, he most likely had a palatial estate. Uh, so here the young, um, uh, rich young ruler perhaps is, is the opposite extreme of a tax collector. And that's why I wrote, not a tax collector. Because, you know, he was not only rich, but he was young, he was successful, he was entrepreneurial, everything he had it going, right? He, he, he had everything going for himself. Everyone that looked at him as the rich young ruler would have assumed he's going to heaven. You know, everybody wanted to be with him. Everybody would want to be. So everything that Matthew wasn't, you know, the tax, the, the rich young ruler was. He was, you know, everybody thought that he was blessed. He was definitely a son of Abraham. Um, he was the very opposite. Everybody would want to rub shoulders with him, the rich young ruler. But, and, but you know, the rich young ruler, um, we don't know his name. We know a lot of things about him. We know he's a ruler, he was rich, um, but we don't know much else about him, and we don't know his name. So in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 18, um, and verse 18, uh, it says, Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And if you uh, re read that with a little bit of maybe um, uh, him coming with a little flattery, maybe you're probably, you're probably reading it correctly. So here he comes, the rich young ruler, he comes and he approaches Jesus, and he's, you know, approaching him just like he would canvass any other um, rabbi of the time and saying, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What, what is it that I, that I must do? So he's obviously seeking eternal life. Um, so he approaches with a little flattery. Um, and so Jesus said to him, um, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. So Jesus asks a question. He doesn't answer his question right out, but asks him a question. He says, why are you calling me good? There's one good, and that is God. And so this must have taken uh, the rich young ruler uh, back a little bit. Um, Jesus doesn't answer him. But then what Jesus does is something interesting. In verse 20, he says, you know the commandments. I mean, you're a rich young ruler. You, you, know, you know the law. You, you know how to be saved. Torah is revealed in Torah. You know the law. You know what you must do to be saved. And so um, Jesus then goes on and he says, um, and he t talks about the second half of the law. He doesn't talk about the first part of the law, the first four commandments, but he just goes to the second, second part of the law and he says, well, you know, you know the commandments, right? And he goes, and in Matthew's account, he does it in order. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, five. He skips number 10. And so here in Luke's account, does it a little bit different. He goes seven, six, eight, nine, five. But he says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And then Jesus is silent. He doesn't say anything else. This was, of course, intentional. What is that 10th commandment, by the way? Tenth commandment is you shall not covet your neighbor's house. We, the covet is, we don't use that word as much, covet, but, you know, what would be another synonym for covet? To be greedy? To, to have what you don't have, right? Uh, and it says you should not covet your neighbor's wife, 
or his male servant or his ox or his donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. This would not have been lost on the rich young ruler. He would have known that Jesus knew the one thing, the one thing that he had struggles with is the very thing that he leaves out. It's the one thing. At this point, he knows that he is known. He is standing before Jesus naked, as it were, fully known, and he notices that there is no condemnation from Jesus. There is no condemnation. But Jesus knows the one thing, and he's standing there. And this conversation, of course, did not go the way the rich young ruler expected it to. Just like the conversation with Matthew didn't go like he expected it to, it didn't go as expected with the Pharisees as well. There's a, there's a series of expectations that you, you know, we kind of just keep missing because Jesus turns everything on its head. He does things very differently. And so Hebrews 4.13 says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom he must give account. That rich young ruler notices that he's standing now in front of somebody who knows him. And he knows his one thing. And isn't it sometimes that we will set up our worship service or we will set up the sermons that we like to hear? There are certain things that we like Jesus to tell, tell us. We like to hear Jesus tell us certain things. And so we will craft everything around us, the music we listen to, everything around the things that we like to hear Jesus say to us. But there are some things that we probably don't want Jesus to say to us. And that's exactly what the rich young ruler hears. Is the one thing that he doesn't want Jesus to say is exactly the one thing that Jesus does say to him. And so when, Jesus, when, when, he's, when he continues, I can almost see maybe the rich young ruler <clears throat> clearing his voice after Jesus has said this to him. Um, I have kept all of these since my youth. Maybe his voice cracked. You know, he's like... I've been found out. There's, there's something here. I'm not here with a peer. I'm not conversing with a peer anymore. I'm, I'm here naked standing before Jesus, and he knows me. And so maybe with a cracked voice, he says this, I, all of these I have kept from my youth. And then when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing, one thing, just one thing. It's just, it's just one thing. Now, it should be pretty easy for someone like you who's kept all the commandments since you were young. It's just one little thing. Um, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. Follow me is an invitation to acceptance and a new start. But what does he do? You know, this was an incredible invitation. You know, Jesus often is very contextual, and I've mentioned this before, to the four disciples, you know, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. He says, follow me, I will make you fishers of men, right? Because they were fishermen. To the woman at the well, he says, you know, I have living water. She was thirsty, she was looking for water. To the rich young ruler here, he tells him, what he needs. He's a man of finance. He's a man of investment. He's saying, I have an investment for you that you can't pass up. He speaks to him the language of economics. He says, I will give you treasures in heaven. This invitation to acceptance and a fresh start. But notice this from Desire of Ages, page 520. He says, the rich young ruler, he wanted the heavenly treasure, but he wanted also the temporal advantages of his riches would bring him. He was sorry that such conditions existed. He desired eternal life, but he was not willing to make the sacrifice. The cost of eternal life seemed too great, and he went away sorrowful, for he had many possessions. So here we have an example of one that was op opposite. Jesus is not saying, you know, uh, and a lot of times, for example, in uh, the verses, he says, but when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very re rich. 
And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, Who then can be saved? If a rich young ruler you know, could not be saved, then who could be saved? But what they had failed to see was that Jesus was not talking just about riches. This is kind of is a verse that's kind of been used and, and kind of misquoted. Jesus is not putting uh, riches and being spiritual or having, you know, as being in conflict with one another. Many rich people are very generous and they give. If you're rich, that just means you have influence, you have power, you have money, you have influence. And you can use that money for good or, 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 or not. But you can use a lot of other things. You can use your beauty, your appearance for good things or bad things. You can use anything that. So Jesus was not talking about riches here specifically, although it applied to him. But he's, Jesus is saying, it's the one thing. And maybe we all have a one thing. Or a two thing. Or a three thing. But it doesn't really matter how many th- those things. Jesus is still there accepting. He's like, oh, you have a one thing? Oh, that's okay. You can still be my disciple. Right? That's a positive thing. Uh, there was, in this young man, in, you know, I can picture in mind, there was a struggle going on in his head. He, had, he already had influence. He was already accepted by everybody else. He didn't need acceptance. He was already accepted. And he had money to back up his interests. So the real struggle is here. Jesus is offering him eternal life, the very thing that he came to ask for. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus offers it to him. He says, come, follow me. But he chooses not to follow. Continuing on, Luke 18, 27 says, but he said, these things which are impossible with men are possible with God. That should be an amen, right? (laughs) Um, Things that are impossible. And what it's meaning is, if you feel like you're too far to be saved, it might seem impossible to us, but it's not impossible for God. You know, sometimes people will think that, oh, man, I I made a mistake, or I really screwed up my life. I've done this. Well, first of all, you're not powerful enough to screw up your life just like that. God has, God's power and God's grace is more abundant than whatever we can do to mess up our lives. We might have cracks. We might be broken. But that just means that we're empty and that there's room for us for Jesus to fill us with something better. The problem is that when we feel like we're full, like we have no need, that's when we should be worried about, when we feel satisfied, when we are, feel like we're full. So, the rich young ruler, what was his motivation for coming to Jesus? Seeking salvation, right? But it was kind of almost as as a transaction. What must I do? But he was seeking salvation. What did Jesus see? He sees disciple material. He offers him, follow me. But what what was the response of the rich young ruler? Was he joyful? He is sorrowful. And so what was the result of that interaction? He walks away from Jesus. And in walking away from Jesus, he's walking away from the salvation that he was seeking. He didn't know it at the time, perhaps, but by walking away from Jesus, he was walking away from the very thing that he longed for and wanted. How many times have the things of this world or things might hamper our view of reality? So the next individual we want to look at and compare is the story of Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector. And there's no coincidence that Zacchaeus' story is, starts in chapter 19, and the story we just read was in chapter 18. So here's an example of who can be saved. So here being Zacchaeus, being a chief tax collector, uh, one would think that, okay, if you were we already talked about how bad it was to be a tax collector, but if you were a chief tax collector, that means you're probably especially hated. You probably were, you know, especially uh, scorned. Now, 
the story of Matthew, Zacchaeus would have heard this story. That's part of the reason why Zacchaeus, in Matthew's story is kind of the prequel to Zacchaeus' story. Because what happened to Matthew, it says that, you know, that went out like wildfire. Everybody wanted to, like, couldn't believe. He asked the tax collector to be his disciple. Could you imagine all the tax collectors thinking, wow, did you hear about Matthew? He's now a disciple of Jesus. That would have gone, and people would have been just blown away. They would have been talking about it for a long period of time that Jesus had a tax collector as one of his disciples. So I'm sure that Zacchaeus must have heard about this, this Jesus that has a tax collector as one of his disciples. From Desire of Ages, uh, page 552, it says, Only a few miles from Jericho, John the Baptist had preached at the Jordan, and Zacchaeus had heard the call of repentance and the instruction to the publicans, exact no more than that which is appointed to you. Throughout, though outwardly disregarded, had impressed his mind. He knew the scriptures, and he was convicted that his practice was wrong. Now hearing the words reported to have come from the great teacher, he felt that he was a sinner in the sight of God, yet what he had heard of Jesus, it kindled hope in his heart. Repentance, reformation of life was possible even for him. So Zacchaeus is excited. He sees that there's this possible for reformation. And so that's what causes Zacchaeus to run and climb up a tree to do those things. So in Luke uh, 19, verses 1 and 2, that says that Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was short of stature. So he, he wanted to see who Jesus was. He had heard about him, and he wanted to get to know him. Verses 4 through 5, So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and he said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay, I must stay at your house. You know, at first we, we might have read the story after reading verse 18 and would have said, oh, Zacchaeus was a rich man and he was a tax collector. Well, you know, so sorry for him. He's not going to heaven, right? But that's not what happens, right? That's not what the story tells. So he climbs up a sycamore tree. Jesus looks up. And amazingly, Jesus knows his name. Jesus knows his name. He looks up to him and he knows his name. He says, come down. And then... Did you notice how he receives him? So he came haste and came down and received, received him joyfully. If you track the story of the rich young ruler and the story of Zacchaeus, you see the same things happening, but the results are very different. Zacchaeus is not sorrowful, but Zacchaeus is joyful. But when they saw it, they all complaining, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. The same thing that happened to Matthew, the same guys that were complaining. Who was complaining? Who was it today? The Pharisees, the religious leaders, those who thought themselves better than somebody else. They were the ones that were complaining. They said, can't believe he's gone to be, uh, eat with him. So I can see them being at the Zacchaeus, you know, uh, home. His wife made, you know, really good hummus or whatever. And so they're enjoying there. They're sitting down, eating in Zacchaeus' house, in Zacchaeus' home. And he says, Then Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Fourfold was required by the law, so he knew the law. But he says, if I have wronged anybody, I will give him that. Now, assume that Zacchaeus was worth $10 million, and he gives half of it to the poor, that means he's got $5 million. So, if he has done this 
you know, and gained all his wealth by fraudulent actions, then that means if he was going to do fourfold, that means he would owe $40 million if that's what he took. So Zacchaeus here, he says this because Zacchaeus is actually an honest guy. He has not defrauded people. Because if he would have defrauded people, there was no way that he would have made that statement. By the way, Zacchaeus, does anybody know what Zacchaeus means in the name? It means pure. Zacchaeus' name means pure. Interesting. And then Jesus said to him, Today salvation comes to this house because he is also a son of Abraham. Now, everybody that Jesus interacted with was a son of Abraham. So I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying something else. He was saying that maybe Zacchaeus is more like Abraham in his faith. Maybe Zacchaeus is being more like Abraham because he is generous, like Abraham was generous. Now, what came, what came first? Who came to Zacchaeus' house? Who came to Zacchaeus' house? Jesus, right? Jesus came to Zacchaeus' house. What did Jesus bring with him? What did Jesus bring with him when he, when he came to Zacchaeus' house? He brought salvation. He brought salvation. See? Jesus came to his house. Today's salvation has come to this house. And that's the order that things should happen. We get Jesus, we get salvation. It's not the other way around. Jesus is the, the reason. Jesus is the answer. He is it. He is the reward. And if we try to find other things, we're just going to be disappointed. Jesus is the point. Jesus is the answer. He is salvation. And this is perhaps, uh, this is Jesus now saying, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. This perhaps is the most succinct statement that Jesus makes about his ministry. Is this is why he came, to seek and to save those which were lost. So, Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, what was his motivation? What, 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 did he, what did he want? Did he want a transaction with Jesus? No, he just saw, he wanted to see who Jesus was. He just wanted to be with, he just wanted to see who he was. What did Jesus see? Well, Jesus looks up to the tree and he sees him and he knows him by name and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. Jesus knows him. So what was Zacchaeus' response? He was joyful. He was joyful. And what was the result of their interaction? Jesus came to his house and he brought salvation to his house. This is a, a quote um, that I like. I, I saw it this week uh, from Ty Gibson, uh, and I thought it, it worked really well. Um, and it says, When Jesus came into the world, he was overwhelmingly attracted to the disowned, disliked, and disenfranchised, the poor, the sick, the immoral, the used, the depressed, the hurting, the jacked up, and the knocked down. That's me, so I know Jesus is attracted to me. I think that's a pretty good quote. You know, perhaps this morning um, you have one thing, or maybe it's a two thing. Give it to Jesus. And perhaps, you know, at times we've made me imagine ourselves to be better than other people, more superior than other people, like the Pharisees. But we know that that's not true. We know that if Jesus was to shine his light on us, that we would be just like everyone else. He offered Levi Matthew and those who attended his party, those who were sinners, those who were doubtful reputation, the invitation to follow him. And he offers us this morning that same invitation. That invitation was for the whole of human history has been of acceptance and a fresh start. And even religious people need a fresh start, especially religious people that might think themselves to be too full. Jesus is the reward. Jesus the in, um, is the one who is kind of the heart of it. So Jesus says to us this morning, his, his invitation for you and me is this, I know that you're broken. I know that you're cracked. I know that you are empty 
but you're just the kind of people that I'm looking for. Because Jesus can fix those cracks in our lives. Jesus can fix those broken pieces in our lives. And he can put them together in a better way. And then he can fill us with better things, with his, with his teachings, with his new wine. Uh, from Desire of Ages, page 113. Um, this is kind of in closing. And it says, And the word that was spoken to Jesus at the Jordan, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. She says, Embraces humanity. God spoke to Jesus as our representative with all our sins and weaknesses. We are not cast aside as worthless. So this morning, I, wanna, I want you to do something. So turn to your right and look at the person and tell them, you are not cast aside as worthless. Go ahead, do it. Just, you are not cast aside as worthless. Now turn to your left, if you're not, and say, and say the same thing. You are not cast aside as worthless. Now, I'll ask you to do something even harder. Say, I am not cast aside as worthless. Jesus' invitation for us today is follow me. Follow me. Follow me. So when you hear the words follow me, you should be hearing acceptance and a fresh start. Jesus offers that to us each and every day. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus, for his example. He did not look down upon us uh, and just shunned us or ignored us, but he engaged with us. He ate with us. And he is willing to mend those broken pieces of our lives. This morning, Father, we come and we are empty. We don't pretend to be full, but Lord, we acknowledge that we are broken. We are cracks in our lives. But we know that you can fix them, and so we give them over to you. And we accept your invitation to follow you. And we accept that, Lord, that acceptance that we have in you. And so we just, Lord, delight in that, that you give us those opportunities for a new, fresh start. And we take that this, this morning and throughout this week. We pray that you would fill our lives with that assurance of acceptance and a new start. For we ask it in his name. Amen.